Um, so uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Rob O'Malley. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, I am a white man with short gray blonde hair and a short beard. And I'm a project director for the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion, or DOZER program at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, and the organizer of this panel on behalf of AAAS. Uh, on behalf of the panel, I want to gratefully acknowledge the diverse and vibrant indigenous peoples on whose ancestral homelands we stand. I am joining you from East Central Maryland, the homeland of the Piscataway people. For those in North America, I encourage each of you after our session to visit native-land.ca. Uh, after our session, if you haven't checked out that site before, to learn more about the indigenous communities in your region and to consider ways to take action to support them. In particular, for educators and parents, I want to highlight a resource from the National Museum of the American Indian called Native Knowledge 360 about integrating indigenous perspectives into teaching. And the link is in chat. Um, I have just three slides to share in this introduction, and they are also available as a PDF with alt text for all images in our exhibit hall booth under documents. Um, the first slide I'm showing now just lists the name of our session, Conservation and Environmental Justice, Faith Community Perspectives on Science Communication and Engagement, and our panelists. Um, and I will, in just a moment, post the Twitter handles of our panelists in the chat. Um, please note that the first part of this session is recorded. The second part, which will be a more open discussion with attendees, uh, will not be recorded. The DOZER program at AAAS fosters communication and engagement about science between scientific and religious communities, recognizing that these often overlap. We organized this panel in collaboration with the AAAS Center for Public Engagement with Science and Technology. The center's work supports scientists in their engagement with policymakers and the public, recognizing that we all have much to learn and to share with each other. Seven in 10 US adults claim a religious affiliation, according to recent polling. Religion and spirituality are important uh, dimensions of identity for more, most adults in the US and worldwide, yet are sometimes perceived as being in conflict with valuing science and are not always explicitly acknowledged in science communication and engagement discourse. Um, even when practitioners recognize the role that faith and faith communities can play in environmental justice work and other civic concerns, perceived barriers of culture, values, and identity can hinder constructive and impactful engagement. This session was proposed as a moderated discussion among faith leaders, faith representatives, and attendees interested in conservation and environmental justice, highlighting diverse perspectives on challenges and opportunities in this domain, and also seeking common ground in mutual respect and in shared values. Um, I consider all the panelists here today to be fellow science communicators. In addition to their own independent engagement work, all have been involved with AAAS programs and projects um, as highlighted on the slide. Um, I'm getting a notice that slides are not showing. Is that true for other folks? Can people see the slides? Yes, okay. Um, I, and they are again available in our booth if anyone cannot see them currently. Um, so some of this includes a recent moderated conversation on faith and environmental justice at the AAAS annual meeting in February ongoing work with the AAAS Science for Seminaries program, which supports the integration of science content and activities into theological school education, and participation in the AAAS How We Respond initiative, which focuses on the stories of communities and scientists taking action on climate change and related science and society issues. And I'm tremendously grateful to these panelists and to all of you for joining us here today. Um, so this third and final slide, which is just going to be on here for just a, a moment, lists some websites to learn more about our presenters, and I'll post the full text of this in the chat in just a moment. Um, and I also encourage you to connect with our AAAS programs in the virtual exhibit hall here at Inclusive SciComm. Uh, I will hand these things over to our moderator and my boss, Dr. Katie Hinman, to introduce herself. Uh, she'll then invite each of the other panelists to introduce themselves and share some initial reflections. And after these introductory comments, Katie will have um, some short moderator discussion before we open it up to a, a broader discussion with all of you. And with that, I will turn it over to Katie and I'll be posting some additional info in chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. It is a delight to be here as part of Inclusive SciComm and to be with this wonderful panel of speakers. Um, 
My name is Katie Hinman. My pronouns are she, her, and uh, I am a white woman with uh, long brown and gray hair and glasses. Uh, panelists, I'll invite you when you introduce yourself uh, in uh, recognition of any visually impaired folks, if you feel comfortable sharing a physical description of yourself uh, when you introduce yourself, that would be great. Um, as Rob mentioned, um, I am the Associate Director of the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion here at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. My background is that I have a PhD in Ecology and Evolution from Stony Brook University and a Master of Divinity degree from Candler School of Theology at Emory University. I served uh, for several years as the executive director of Georgia Interfaith Power and Light, which is part of the National Interfaith Power and Light movement that works with faith communities on issues of uh, environmental care and justice. And I served as a, I am a ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. I served as a church pastor for nine years in the United Methodist Church as well, and now work with the Dozer program. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk with these wonderful panelists about the ways that faith communities are involved in environmental sustainability and justice work, uh, and the ways that, um, that uh, science communicators and scientists can um, incorporate considerations of faith and religious background uh, into their work uh, to help uh, bolster the efforts and engagement of uh, both the environmental community and the faith community. So I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves, um, give you about five minutes each to talk just a little bit about your backgrounds and uh, what sorts of things you're working on uh, before we dive into conversation. Uh, so I'm going to start uh, with uh, Mr. Ibrahim Abdul Mateen. Uh, and so if you would like to introduce yourself, please. Oh, I believe you're still muted. There we go. Peace and blessings, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Katie. Thanks for being on, everyone. Um, wherever you are in the universe, it's, it's nice to see you. Nice to be here. Um, so I wrote a book called Green Dean, What Islam Teaches About Protecting the Planet. I wrote it in 2010. It was part of a movement of, um, I would say, of young people that were thinking about what is their role as religious folks or people who are practicing the faith of Islam um, in this larger conversation of, at the time it was the, you know, um, the, the opportunity related to the green economy. Um, how do we make money from uh, repairing some of the harms of the past by creating products and services that clean it up and then um, transform it into some kind of use. That didn't pan out in the same way that I think we thought it would in some ways, but there was the Green Jobs Act and the, um, uh, in the Obama administration and that emphasis on green jobs and energy efficiency. Um, so I got involved in a lot of that work, um, but I wanted to sort of, my opening points that I wanted to say, Katie, um, if I have, I have a, like a few minutes, right? I don't, um, I don't wanna take up too much time, but I wanted to give people like a sense of my, per, my point of view. Um, I used to be, anyone, you don't even, I can't even ask people to raise their hand, but anyone ever um, work or go on a trip with Outward Bound? If, if there's any way you could re respond to that, anyone do like an Outward Bound trip? So think about that or what you know of Outward Bound. Um, I used to take middle school kids in Boston on an island in Outward Bound for our Outward Bound week long trips around this island. Um, one of some of the most magical times. But the reason why I wanted to share it is you would get these super urban kids into the salt marshes, pulling up their, you know, the boots and forgetting that they ever didn't like mud ever in their life and getting into the mud and looking at the animals and really trying to find those very special things in there that spark an interest in science that could, would, you know, probably last to this day in all of them. So like very like visceral. Um, so those are the moments that I wanted to share as part of the, the I think the way we need, we need people to get into the world um, and to understand these things. Another example of that is, um, and by way of introduction, is that I worked in um, uh, Prospect Park, uh, at Brooklyn's Prospect Park. 
and I was a director of youth programs. And we, we were trying to get people, to, young people, so we connected with schools and I mean, with other parks and other places around the city that were preserving natural areas. And we did exchanges with the young people preserving those areas. And we framed it to them as they were protecting the last forest, the last ecological areas in the city. And they had this sense of a mission that they were doing something really special. Um, uh, another example that I'll get is uh, I worked at DEP, which is New York City's Department of Environmental Protection, which manages the city's water supply. So I was essentially a spokesperson for the agency. We have the water supply, which is one of the, the gems on the planet Earth. The reason why New York City is awesome is because we have this incredible water supply that literally gets zero federal money. And I want to emphasize that. New York City's water supply, zero federal money. Um, uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute gem. But we would have, also we manage the sewer infrastructure. That we, we would have people, and that relates to the water quality of the water bodies around us. And you would have people that looked rough, off the street, tough, that would come in and had gotten the, the, the protocol for how we accept water quality data and had gotten it themselves and the, using the same protocols, bringing that in to support the city's efforts to gather data about the water bodies. So that's the, the context of the people. I think when you think about in, environmental justice, everyone wants to go into definitions and talk about areas and policy, but it's also real human beings that are out here living and surprising people every day and trying to transform where they live or just try to understand where they live in the same way. And people do use science. They believe in, in, in a way that's practical. And the last example that I'll give um, is, you know, I think one of the hurdles we have is air quality, right? So when we think about the intersection of all these things, we need to have better indoor air quality monitoring that will save lives. There's obviously policies related to environmental justice, like um, banning the use of fossil fuels. And soon, a lot of people are going to get tested whether they're going to want to have a gas stove or an electric stove. <laughs> you know, some of you guys have people are going to have a tough choice. Um, but then that, that relates directly to indoor air quality. And those are some of the great things people are starting to figure out. What are the tools to monitor indoor air quality? And what does that mean? And what does that look like? Um, anyway, so this is great stuff. I want to just loft up some of those ideas. I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Grant, if you'd like to introduce yourself and give some opening background and thoughts, that would be great. Greeting, uh, greetings. Thank you, Dr. Henman. It's, it's good to be on uh, this wonderful panel. Um, I am a middle-aged Black woman with, um, I guess, auburn and Black highlights to cover up the gray that's coming in on the sides. But uh, I still feel young. I still feel young on this wonderful Friday morning. I am a seminary professor, so persons who are preparing for a life in ministry and Christian ministry or as a chaplain in the hospital or as a, a Christian educator, they come to our school, many come to our school in Salisbury, North Carolina. I'm at Hood Theological Seminary in North Carolina. And it is a seminary sponsored by the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Churches. It is a North American uh, Black Methodist denomination, and they sponsor this institution that I serve with. I am also a former environmental scientist. Um, my undergrad was in biology and uh, uh, with a minor in chemistry, and I served as an environmental scientist where I would um, work as a GC chemist, analyzing a lot of samples of air and, and, and soil and, and, um, and water and other kinds of instrumentation. Um, and, um, and I'm also a former pastor. I'm ordained as an AME, not AME Zion, as I mentioned at the school where I served. There's another African Methodist Episcopal Church where I am ordained as an elder. And so I used to pastor in San Antonio, Texas um, before um, I was um, uh, relocated to, to, to North Carolina. So I come into this work of, conserve, of conservation and environmental um, um, justice from the perspective of having served as a scientist where I was analyzing samples that were the result of oil spills, where I was analyzing um, air quality samples because of 
nerve agent that was used in World War II. So I'm, I'm coming from a perspective of, of having been in the laboratory, but now I'm actually in a different kind of a laboratory um, where I'm working with, with, with people and um, really working with not just the, the seminarians who are in school by crafting courses that integrate science um, and, um, and theology, but also working with the community. So this past summer, I'm really excited to say that we had a wonderful uh, camp. We had um, persons from three years old all the way to about 73. It was an intergenerational science camp. And we brought in um, astronomers. We brought in environmental scientists. We brought in biologists. Uh, we brought in engineers. And we brought in um, water, uh, water conservationists that, that really shared the importance of understanding how the water that we drink, the air that we breathe, the soil that we stand on, all of it forms the, the, the ecosystems, um, I'm sorry, and the atmosphere that, we, that, you know, that, that surrounds all of us, um, it, it all contributes to, um, to the environment that, that is in crisis right now. And so one of the things that, that really um, excited me is that every student this year that was eight years old and, uh, and above got a microscope. And we had the biologists show them how to use the microscope and how to analyze the soil around them. Um, and the, um, the fourth graders in particular, uh, they really got a hold to the, the topic of photosynthesis and what happens when, you know, plants don't, you know, can't, can't get, uh, enough sunlight to be able to, to conduct photosynthesis. For me, I didn't learn until, uh, about photosynthesis until I was really in, in high school or in college. So to have elementary kids already getting excited about photosynthesis and being able to have a, a microscope, I'm hoping we'll be able to contribute to scientific literacy and curiosity that will help um, um, us with, with, with crafting young people that can help us solve some, some of, 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 our, of our problems. Um, and the second piece is to have older people, I'm talking about elderly people, retirees saying, I had heard about climate change um, as if it was some foreign entity. And now I realize that we have been taking so many things for granted. We've been singing some of these hymns in church, but we don't really realize the impact of human activity um, on the degradation of nature around us. So I, um, I'm, a seminary, I'm a seminary professor, but I also started a center on the campus where I serve called the International Center for Faith, Science, and History. And we call it IC Fish for short because it's a, it's a, a mouthful. But we have been um, fortunate enough in the time of pandemic to connect with scientists all over the world to help us realize the gift that we have in biological diversity and how, um, and how God always gives us options with regard to, to, to everything that, that, uh, that we face and that we, we really should take our charge of creation care seriously. And so, um, so I come here understanding that, that as an African American, we have a, uh, um, an, an unfortunately uh, tragic relationship with science because of the objectification and the commodification of our people during the transatlantic slave trade. And so we have to just name that, that we have been scientific experiments uh, for a large part of our time here in North America. And so that, meant that, that has meant that we've had a very painful experience with, with, um, with science. And so we use the uh, person of George Washington Carver. He's a very important African-American scientist to really kind of name um, that pain because he was involuntarily castrated. And so, um, so to have him rise above that pain and become a very important 20th century uh, scientist because he's showing farmers whose land has been depleted because of the cotton industry, how to restore the nutrients back to the soil so that you can make a, land, uh, make a living off of the soil. So his work, I think is extremely important because Carver ultimately wants to focus on the relationships between plant life, between the minerals, 
between animals, because if you, if you have no ecological health, you'll have no human health. So that's the work that we do here. Wonderful, thank you so much. And uh, Reverend Thank you, Burton, thank you Sharon. Yeah, Reverend yeah. Burton, would you like to share some of your background and what you're working on? Yeah, I wanna thank uh, you, Dr. Hinman, uh, these other outstanding panelists here, uh, AAS, AAAS, and uh, Rob O'Malley for this opportunity, this privilege just to be in this space. Uh, I stumbled into uh, advocacy, environmental advocacy, environmental justice work by way of pragmatism. Uh, so over 10 years ago, when I was being considered, 10 and a half years ago, being considered to be pastor of New Northside, I, during my interview process, I, I presented the idea of the church getting solar panels for pragmatic reasons. The trend is less and less uh, uh, folks going to the actual church buildings. And so the African-American churches are our heritage. And let me stop. I, I'm a, a middle-aged African-American black male uh, of average looks. And so that's for, I wanted to put that out there. Uh, but I just thought the solar panels would be a way to reduce costs so that the, in our church is over hundred years old so that the church could be sustained for future generations. Little did I know that that would lead to, or providentially, as the Puritans might say, that would lead to being approached by uh, advocacy groups some folks may have heard of, the Sierra Club, and they approached and educated myself, and we joined in in a campaign to, uh, uh, we joined in another camp, a number of campaigns. And that led to collaborations with Earth Justice, with the Nature Conservancy, with uh, a local environmental groups uh, such as U.S. Green Build, um, Missouri Coalition for the Environment, the Franciscan Sisters. And along the way, as we learn more, we learn and I was able to communicate to our congregation. And likewise, our congregation would communicate to other congregations that traditionally the view that environmental work was left to, you know, upper middle class whites, no, we all have a dog in this fight. And in, in, in addition to all the number of uh, uh, advocacy that African-Americans have historically been pushing into, we've had to push into this space of environmental justice and green theology. Because as one time when they did a film, a documentary film about our congregation, we asked everyone who had asthma or knew someone that had asthma, to raise up their inhaler, raise their hands. It was three quarters of the church, including my family. And so that's just one visceral way that climate change is impacting the African-American church. And so we feel that part of our advocacy and one of our successes has been uh, to get uh, uh, Resolution 124 in St. Louis, in which St. Louis joined, committed to green, clean energy by 2035, as well as other uh, uh, initiatives, uh, advocacy, you know, we, we've been working in this space and we were brought to this space by learning from the scientific community and learning the resource, re learning from the research. And I just want to say now, right now, the challenge is, I appreciate uh, uh, Professor Cop, Professor Sharon laying that out is because of the trauma in the history of the scientific scientific relationship with African Americans, there's a hesitancy, and so even though data is showing that we need vaccines, we're dealing with battling and overcoming that hesitancy. So that's where we right now. That's what we're working on. In addition to the advocacy, in addition to the educational piece, and just like right now, this has just been such a blessing. I just got educated from these panelists right here, and so every round is, is, is taking us higher and higher in this work, which everyone needs clean air, everyone needs clean soil, everyone needs clean water. And so it's a work that we're happy to be doing collaboratively. Thanks.